Um, I hi, everybody. I'm Andrea Herman. And I've been asked to uh, have the honor to introduce uh, Mr. Doug Fine, author of Hemp Bound, and I'll let, you, I'll let him tell his story. But mine and Doug's story started from an actual connection from Missouri, my home state, uh, that's now in Oregon. And I was just asking Doug, how did you ever get a hold of me? And he says, I want to write a book about industrial hemp, and I hear you can help me do that. And I said, all right, well, who do you want to meet? And he put, put a list together, and I'll make some forwarding emails. And he did it. Came up here, and since then, he's been able to travel around the globe representing all of us here, talking about industrial hemp and learning and coming back and sharing. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Doug Fine. Give you a hug. Yeah. All right, man. This, this is my hero. Let's see, I will hopefully not cause feedback by setting this mic down since we're gonna go to the mobile mic. Thank you, Brandon and the tech crew, and uh, what a fantastic musical evening we're having. Really nice job, Kim chose the band. How about a hand for the band? That was a <laughs> and, and we'll hear more of them uh, a little bit later on. Um, some of what you're gonna hear uh, tonight is gonna be a slightly US-centric, um, but even in my Heartland talks, it's about bowing down to you if you're Canadian. You Canadians, I'm telling you this genuinely from my heart, from my family to your family, thank God you guys brought back hemp in 1998. Humanity owes Canada a big round of applause. Thank you, Canada. Really. You, uh, you're humble, you don't like acknowledging yourselves, um, but uh, ever since I lived in Haines, Alaska, 39 miles from the Yukon, um, I've, I've, we, we kind of give each other dual citizenship with the Yukoners, and I think up through Whitehorse they do it with us Alaskans. So uh, I'm in love with your country, but I'm also uh, wanting to send props out to my countrymen up back there in the uh, Kentucky contingent. This was uh, during a big first legal U.S. Digital Age Hemp Harvest Tour I took um, with detours in Slovenia and uh, the Netherlands. Um, but uh, during the Kentucky leg, Craig Lee, a real legendary uh, Kentucky hempster in the, what would that be, left foreground, um, found out that this big ritzy horse farm, I'm forgetting the name of him now, shout, shout it out if any of you, you guys know that, um, which one it was, used to be a hemp farm uh, antebellum uh, before the Civil War in the US. Uh, and Craig made some calls and found out that um, this farm had these sort of dusty old hemp breaks uh, in a barn. And um, the funny thing is, it was in a barn that was once a hemp processing barn a long time ago, 150 years ago plus, before it was a horse farm. Um, so we cleaned it up a little bit and it works. It's not that hard to hand break hemp. I'm curious, how many people here have hand broken hemp fiber? Because you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to have fun with you guys tonight, and I'm trying to entertain, but I'm also subtly trying to get you, blessed dang Canucks on the fiber bandwagon a little bit here. The seed is fantastic. The growth curve is amazing. I understand the the seed thing. Thank God, thank God, Sean. Are you all of you guys that the farmers that went into my girlfriend's prenatal care was organic Canadian grown hemp seed oil. So I'm the, the well being of my family. Um, I owe thanks to you Canadians, and Andrea, she mentioned the book and the theories and the things we're going to be talking about here are hugely, I'm hugely indebted to her. Uh, the introductions that she made uh, for me, I just thank God. Thank you for trusting me and uh, believing that I'd do a good job. She didn't even know I was going to be really nice to her in the book. She, she in fact said she got three quarters of the way through the book thinking, I guess I'm not important enough to be mentioned, and then like, the rest of the book's about her. Um, so. I'm also asking you guys, uh, my audience, generally speaking, this is a very unusual audience for me, not that unusual, I guess, at this point, um, but generally speaking, it's college students and, um, or literary festivals, that kind of thing. And um, so because you guys are professionals, God, that last farmer conversation today, uh, before the end of the day, I felt like I was in kindergarten. That talk was way over my head. And here I am giving a talk to you. So. Um, Understand that my, my part of my job is uh, heartfelt 
uh, evangelism for hemp and the return of the cannabis plant to humanity, but um, you need to steer me and correct me if you feel like the message is off key, either for your, your own niche, um, Canada or hemp as a, as a whole. I'm sure I'll make some mistakes and I have no ego about uh, improving my knowledge base, which went, improved about a thousand fold today. My goodness, great, great, great panels and speakers today. Um, so, um, it was a really big year for hemp in the US. Um, I'm curious for Canadian hempsters how, how far the story has spread. Show of hands, how many people know about, know of Ryan Laughlin? Just one, one of many hemp heroes and um, all, all around the world. But uh, what he did in Colorado was kind of cool. He lives in a conservative corner of southeast um, Colorado, really abutting Kansas. Very, very politically conservative. And uh, he and his family put their federally subsidized farm at risk before the U.S. Farm Bill changes uh, this past February. This year, they're, they're fully legal. Um, but uh, he showed his neighbors that uh, took half the water of the wheat that they're generally farming in that part of Colorado. And it was an important message because I, I, you probably know, maybe it's a Canadian issue as well, but the, the Kuala, Aglala aquifer is, is drying out and farmers are not being able to pump what they once were in the monoculture cycle. And um, I don't know if, if discussing genetically modified foods and organisms is controversial or not with this audience, but I cannot end this evening without thanking you for instituting the prophylactic um, GMO uh, uh, situation here in Canada. It's something that I'd, I'd like to emulate um, in the States. Uh, I have no idea. This is the great thing about dashing in and out, that kind of thing. I have no idea about really like any factionalism or anything. I just feel like I'm here with the hemp family and that's the end game here. You guys are talking about real issues here and there's real legitimate um, areas of discussion. I'm, I'm purposely keeping this vague. And the finish line in our hearts is very clear. It's a bottom line finish line. It's the continued growth of this plant and its return uh, to the worldwide economy for the good of our, our, our families, our well-beings and economies, but also for the good of the planet and for the good of humanity. Um, I think we're all in that. We all know about the hemp brand and um, let's keep our, our eyes on the goal line. Anyway, so uh, Ryan Laughlin, 2013. This year, 2014, this is just a few weeks ago, uh, this particular farm is a not, run by a nonprofit called Growing Warriors, a veterans uh, group. Mike Lewis has a fantastic story uh, storyline. He uh, himself was a veteran, um, uh, but his brother uh, suffered a sniper uh, injury, a head injury, uh, while serving, and uh, came back. And through those series of circumstances that often will will strike returning veterans, um, wound up on food stamps and wasn't doing too well immediately. And they've turned this into Mike wasn't really a, a hamster. He wasn't devoted. To, to hemp, uh, he was kind of pushed into it by how enthusiastic non-liberal Kentucky is about this plant. He really thought from a food security perspective, it was the best, best thing he can do and he's doing it uh, very well. So other than your, your Can you Canadians work uh, in 1998, it was a really big year. And, and again, apology for the US centric uh, uh, nature of this slide, you know, just because the US ended prohibition, um, your Canadians are going, yeah, where were you uh, all this time ago? Uh, but we Americans got us into this insane drug war mess and at least give us some credit. Bless those Oregonians, good friends of Andrea and mine uh, for, for taking one more step uh, in November to get us out of this mess. Um, does everybody here know that the cannabis legalization in Oregon on November 4th included a, a provision on, on hemp? It did. It mandates the uh, state agriculture department to get a system in place for farmers next spring. Uh, quick nuance on the politics in the states. What happened last February, to paraphrase, is a provision in our ginormous farm bill uh, allows hemp for research purposes in states that have their own hemp cultivation uh, laws as long as uh, the hemp cultivators are in some way connected with an institution of higher learning and or a state agriculture department. And the, the, you, I, I guess I shouldn't speak to Canadians or any uh, business person about bureaucracy, but the loopholes in the bureaucracy that people are exploiting, I think, to the best in the U.S. To give you one, ex uh, uh, one example, Andre, jump and stop me if this is no longer true, but he told me this earlier in the season. In order to have a university associated with his project, Ryan Laughlin, this fellow who really put his, put his family on the line last year doing everything he could to be legal this year, 
Colorado was at first, Colorado State is starting to change its attitudes. Uh, it's going to be all clear in the, in the next few years. But he couldn't get any established, well-known university to sign a piece of paper on university letterhead that he could have on his farm to be in sync with federal law. Even though the state of Colorado is, one, is the only state that I know of in the US that supersedes, that tries to supersede federal law, and its state ag department issues commercial cultivation permits for hemp farmers in Colorado this year. That's different than, than the model in other states, although, stop me if I'm wrong, Kentuckians, you guys have de facto commercial legalization because your state has decided it's research, but you can sell the crop. Am, am I right? How is that not commercial? Thank God. And, and so you know how much I appreciate that? I today wrote up draft le hemp legislation for my state of New Mexico and in included that uh, research includes market and sales research. So, you know, sounds good to me. We also, uh, some of you might know, have a pending bill in the US Congress right now that uh, will fully um, uh, remove cannabis, 0.3% of THC or less, from the controlled, our Federal Controlled Substances Act uh, and put it under the purview of the USDA. Um, it has a lot of bipartisan support, and granted, he was already on the team, but uh, when Earl, I was in Oregon covering the Measure 91 cannabis legal and hemp legalization, uh, Earl Blumenauer, the congressman from the area, uh, got up to the microphone, and one of the first things he said after congratulating Anthony and the other people who worked on that legalization, he said, I think we can go in this lame duck Congress, just taken by our Republican Party, uh, and push S359 through. I think it has enough bipartisan support that we could get it through. So you hear it from me here, here first. Those who know me know I tend to be extremely optimistic in my predictions, and they've all come true so far, so I'm not uh, trying to curse it, but I'm calling it right here. You heard it here first. S359 is going to pass in this dysfunctional U.S. Congress this year, and there's going to be full commercial legalization in, in the U.S. 50 states in 2015. I really believe it. There's not that much opposition to the hemp stuff anymore in the states. Um, so um, a little bit of a worldwide perspective. I know Anita and, and Jace can speak to, to Europe better than I. But um, I'm really interested in the connection that uh, people are feeling to the return of the hemp plant, the emotive connection that people have. Slovenia, on the outpost of the former Yugoslavia, um, they're 10 years into their modern crop. And the government pays for this kind of grassroots thing called the World Hemp Congress uh, for this official peasant band to come bless the local harvest at the World Hemp Congress. These people are behind it and they're consciously setting it up as a decision between GMO monoculture um, versus more distributed uh, industries, as we all talked about today, that want to have value added, that want to create products. I've been brushing my teeth with a uh, uh, indecipherable bunch of syllables that translates as uh, planet hemp, Slovenian mint hemp clay toothpaste. It's fantastic. My whole family likes it. Um, when I was sending a fact check uh, to one of my uh, subjects in the Slovenian story for a piece of journalism I was writing about it, he responded to my questions, where was your company founded? How old are you? Are you born in this region? And at the end, he said, isn't it interesting how the return of this plant brings people around the world together? So of course, you know, I'm a kind of a progressive kind of guy, you know, the Rastafarians say the cannabis plan is the healing of the nation. That's what they call it. Okay, so, so far you're thinking I'm a hippie, right? Fast forward to about a week and a half ago, and I am at the University of Kentucky's Harvest in Lexington, official Kentucky Republican. This is a real right-wing issue. Uh, give you, some of you will already know this, but to give you a, uh, I shouldn't say right-wing issue, it's a, it's a freedom libertarian Kentucky heritage issue. Um, Seriously, uh, the fantastic agriculture commissioner of Kentucky, he is no tie-dye wearing, lava lamp wearing dude, James Comer, who is running for governor in Kentucky now, and he has made hemp, stop me if I'm wrong, guys, his issue. Is it not his number one issue, would you say, in the Kentucky group? Is it his number one issue? And, and he's riding it on a, on a Kentucky uh, a heritage issue, and no one, no one in that state uh, is objecting. So, Andy, what's his name, the ag guy? Uh, who runs the organics and hemp program for the state. Andy, you know his Adam Watson. Adam, Adam Watson. Adam Watson is the uh, youngster that runs the uh, Kentucky hemp program and also the state organic certification program. And we're standing next to each other as the ceremonial harvest is happening in this small, whatever, maybe a couple acre, maybe one acre crop at the at University of Kentucky Lexington. Uh, the professor gives his speech, the tractor fires up. And I said, I asked Adam a couple of 
straight journalistic questions. And I said, Adam, do you see anything here in the state uh, in the sense of the cannabis plant bringing people that normally don't speak uh, too much together and cooperation, economic and otherwise, spiritual even? He said, this is oh, you know, on the record state official. Oh, yes. Absolutely. It's a really interesting phenomenon to watch. So uh, for all you guys out there who are really serious businessmen and women and, and who have uh, big payrolls to meet and big acreage, God, it's impressive what you guys farm out here. Um, uh, I'm sure I don't have to remind you of this, but lest you ever forget, all over the world people are uh, seeing a deeper meaning to the return of this plant, and I hope that we're not uh, embarrassed to show that side of us. I think it's part of the, bra part of the, uh, part of the brand. So um, this is the part of the spiel I want you guys to sort of, over the next day or so, give me feedback that you think works or doesn't. It's just this process, it's not news to any of you here, I'm calling it tri-cropping. And it's a concept whereby, I'm a, I'm a locavore guy, I'm a distributed uh, uh, um, CSA, farmer's market, organic kind of guy. This is Chinese uh, hemp, uh, imported by Envirotextiles of, of Boulder, and uh, made by my girlfriend. And she's really awesome at this kind of stuff. A lot of my clothing is homemade hemp clothing. I, I live on a solar-powered goat ranch in New Mexico, about 40 miles from the nearest town, and I like it that way. Um, I feel like anytime I'm around civilization for too long, I get sucked into big arguments. Um, so um, I'm just, my arguments are with like my six-year-old and my goats, and that's cool. I can handle that. They're both extremely sane and have good senses of humor. Um, anyway, so try cropping. Um, I like the idea of a single facility, let's say about the size of this room, that has uh, a few seed presses, um, maybe, the, maybe it, and, and all of this is about community ownership, but entrepreneurial spirit, and this is a lot of what Hemp on the Book is about. Um, some fiber processing apps, you know, keep it simple at first, you know, some herd stuff uh, for hempcrete bedding, and uh, I'm a real big fan of gasification. So those are the three legs of, 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 of the tri cropping, and one of the things that's so fascinating to me is, I have to make a joke about nudging, nudging you guys into fiber, and I understand that it was Sean Crew who first understood, explained to me in his offices the, uh, the economics of why, why fiber's, you know, kind of been uh, a little bit late to the game in Canada. But when I talked to hemp flax in the Netherlands, it's the exact opposite. It was pulling teeth for geojonkers to go and deal in Romania with seed processing. And it, the message got through, like there's no, re, it's the same endocannabinoid system in the Netherlands, same health, Omega health benefits, same smart people. Of course, why wouldn't you exploit the oil? And just baby steps. And it's not that no one's doing oil in Europe, but it's, as we all know, primarily fiber. And that was fascinating to me. You don't really see that in too many industries, at least not those that I've covered. You know, if there's good things to have, it's gonna ha every market's gonna have it. And um, maybe that's the nature of globalization, but I like the idea of a community processing, even in smaller amounts, and then through the, through the magical power of value added, um, creating real wealth for their, for their localities um, through this plant. Um, ideal, you know, theoretically through any plant, because the, uh, uh, and thank you Canada for, this, for the seed oil market. I wanna send props to Mr. Crew here, who uh, on the day he met me in his office said, and it's in Hempbound. I am going to parachute into the U.S. the minute uh, you guys legalize, and he has. Uh, I think in, in conjunction, I don't know, I, I hope it's public, with, all, with some of the Kentucky guys in this room. There's, there's, uh, there's harvesting for seed oil happening in Kentucky uh, this year. Gasification is really, is really um, so way to not be a bullshitter, Sean. Um, and, and thank you, by the way, for being in it since the beginning. That picture, has everybody seen it in his office of him with the, uh, with the Mountie and, and his first product called, what is it, Stash or My Stash? My Stash? That's some good stuff right there. That's a smile saying, wow, we just won something. And, and that's how we Americans feel now. We just won something too this past February. Anyway, I, you know, as a father, the energy side is really important to me. For those who aren't familiar with this, uh, any kind of biomass, any kind of waste plant material, not that there necessarily has to be from a hemp harvest, but uh, you can use it to produce relatively carbon-friendly uh, energy through a biomass uh, anaerobic combustion. Uh, it's not the be-all, end-all of the future uh, of our future energy issues that our species faces, but it's a way for today. Uh, it's my big thing journalistically in all my in all my journalistic work. What today can we do to improve, take a step in the right direction? First baby step in the right direction, and it's if the way if the biomass is there. 
you know, you could power your own facility at least, if not your community. And the kind of poster child for this, uh, and it's not a new kind of technology, the poster child for, for the energy side is uh, Feldheim, Germany. They got a lot of press in the uh, New York Times Associated Press, and so they're well known in the States for this gasification thing, but the U.S. Army is buying up gasification units uh, for easy transport into danger zones because it's too much of a hassle to get petroleum uh, uh, in, into theater, as they say. Um, and it's a way that they can gen generate uh, energy, and this is from any biomass. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to, for the first time in my life, be a semi-business guy and, and get some kind of tri-cropping uh, tri facility, uh, what do they call it, turnkey, for communities in some kind of cool profit-sharing way, and I'm talking to some folks about it. And they all are saying, I don't see the numbers crunching out on the gasification, and I'm like, if you had a six-year-old son, you would, because this is about uh, uh, more than just bottom line. This is about this is about bottom line. It's about generational bottom line. It's about producing energy that doesn't come from dinosaur jelly. Okay. Um, all I'll say about this to people who probably know more about what's happening with uh, the future of, of fiber is. Uh, that is the actual fiber off the Dutch hemp flax assembly line that goes into the uh, uh, car part, the, the, the door uh, car part components. And um, that's such a great talking point in the States, you know? If you see a Mercedes, it's probably got uh, hemp in its uh, door paneling. Um, Interestingly, a couple of things about that. Uh, Mark Reinders, some of you probably know him, the uh, managing director of Hemp Flax, one of Europe's longest uh, existing uh, hemp companies, he told me that it's, I shouldn't thank Mercedes and BMW, I should thank the third party car parts manufacturers for recognizing that um, a stronger, lighter, more reliably delivered uh, product was gonna be more cost effective for them. Save, saving the earth, he said, was second or third, I think was his, was his exact quote. Um, the other thing Mark described to me emotionally, like when he got worked up when he was telling me this, was this battle he has with his contract farmers and hey, you know, I live on a 41 acre ranch in New Mexico and people think I'm, I'm you know, uh, Ted Turner or something like that. You know, people from, that I come, from the East Coast think I'm some sort of Grizzly Adams mountain man. And I mean, the acreage that we're talking about here in the heartland, I think you guys know why I barely qualify as rural in New, Mexi in New Mexico, right? So I tend to take the farmer's side on things. Um, so Mark's telling me, this battle he has during field reading, first explained to me by Simon Potter, another very important player in Hempbound. Thank you for your access and tour, Simon, and your great, great work. Um, so he's out there in the field, and there's clouds in the sky, and the weather report is saying 50% chance of rain over the next three days. The farmer wants that crop out of the elements now. And Mark knows by this subtle, I can't remember if he said, look at this fiber, it's not orange enough, or if it's not yellow enough, it needs three more, you know, this, he was serious. And his bottom line is, if it's not perfect, it's, it's not going to these, these high-end applications. So that was his pressure. I'm sure you guys feel a lot of this from one side or another, but to me it was remarkable how sort of touch and go it was with him. Another thing that was touch and go was, as I was leaving my interview with him, um, you, know, you notice my subtly trying to get you guys into fiber, right? Um, as I was leaving my interview with him, we were walking through the, the floor of the facility and there's sparks flying, hammers banging in a far end and I ask what's going on and he takes me over there. This is the, one of the most experienced hemp companies in Europe was welding and jerry-rigging their harvesting equipment um, because they had just gotten some kind of big order from a super high-end um, uh, European um, body care company. Uh, Mark described it to me as sort of like a Monaco boutique. He said it's priced like psych the flowers tips, if he delivers them, are priced like psychoactive cannabis. That's what, that's what he's getting um, for them in that market, a relatively, I guess, relatively new market. So they were welding their, their harvesters to do this second harvest in addition to the main fiber harvest. And now you can see this on YouTube if you do a search under uh, hemp flax dual cropping tractor or something like that. You can see it in operation. I'm sure maybe some of you guys already do uh, some of that stuff, but it was interesting to me that this guy was still figuring out uh, as, it was, as he was going. And, I, and I'm gonna have to, and this is something I do tell to American would-be hempsters, is uh, don't think this industry is just gonna land in your lap and uh, start paying you money. Um, tomorrow is my day for checking out the fascinating um, uh, hempcrete discussion. Um, I was in on that supercapacitor 
uh, battery discussion today. And the reason for that is, I want to show you this off slide photo here. The reason was when I was in this Colorado hemp farm um, three weeks ago now, pretty good, pretty good flower for me. I thought for, for a US crop intended to be a seed crop, I thought it looked pretty good. Uh, um, better on the seed side than anything I'd seen stateside at that point. In any event, I kind of asked what I thought was a bit of a wise-ass journalistic question to this overall 67-year-old uh, fantastic farmer uh, who was doing th this, uh, this crop. Again, not in a liberal part of uh, Colorado. Not Ryan Laughlin, different farmer. Uh, I think Jim Bremer was his name, I believe, 67-year-old fellow. And um, I said, what are you doing with the fiber? And I expected him to say, can you give me a break here? It's like this, the crop just became legal. Give us a break. We're doing a little something with the seed. But no, he kind of like spit out a piece of straw and said, Super capacitors. And I said, really? Super capacitors? And he said, really, super capacitors. Thank you, people probably in attendance here, the Alberta folks. Now, uh, forgive me for not remembering their names, but for your fantastic research that's spreading this. This is like, world, are you aware of the worldwide reverberation of this nanotechnology news that's coming out? I mean, every place is reporting on this, BBC, Anyway, it's about a month or two after the presentation at, at, at the Chemical Society that hemp, what is it, slightly, and I heard his talk today, slightly outperforms uh, to, you know, conventional um, nanotechnology for, for energy storage, which by the way is very toxic and energy intensive to produce, but at one one thousandth of the cost. Oh, just that, right? So <laughs> shortly thereafter, this farmer in way in the middle of nowhere, Colorado, gets contacted by a Boulder tech firm who says, we want to buy all your fiber. We, got, we want to do some energy uh, storage research into it. So things are happening in this industry the world over. And I'll tell you, when I interviewed the uh, European industrial hemp guys for, for you know, M Michael Kyrus and those guys for the, uh, uh, for the hemp bound interview, they were really not bullish on the overall industry nor on the news coming out of the States as having any real impact. And they're singing a different tune today, bless them, thank God. Um, everybody seems to be pretty dang excited by those growth curves <laughs> we were talking about the other day that you guys are seeing just in your uh, seed market. But I was excited to hear that there's stuff happening with the fiber from season one. Um, while we're at it, just a quick other shot of, uh, of a Kentucky harvest. Um, let's see if I can find that. Uh, well, there's Mike Lewis. I was looking for this Katie shot. This is a, a shot that I love, um, frankly, because I like to see women own, run enterprises of any kind, but also in particular because this woman is awesome. You guys know who I'm talking about, right? Katie. Katie, I'm forgetting how to pronounce her last name with an M. Moy, Moyer in Christian County, uh, Kentucky. I know I've got this picture. There it is. So let's go to full screen on that. Um, one thing that I really like about what Katie's doing, besides the fact that she's a mom, um, is that uh, she's answering this issue this Kentucky has with ending the 10-year buyout, is it? 10-year long, some year long payout to people that were going to stop uh, growing tobacco and basically other than niche, it's a, it's just very, I mean, tell, stop me if I'm wrong, struggling, tobacco is struggling in Kentucky. And so this was really interesting to me, this yellow in the background, that's pretty much ready for harvest tobacco. And here's Katie. Katie is a gun rights activist. She came to this uh, through Rand Paul style libertarianism. Um, she is always packing. Um, I know that's hard for, for some Canadians to understand. I tend to be kind of a pacifist myself, except when the bears are going after my goats. Um, but trust me when I tell you that this is as smart, enlightened, and, and well thought out uh, a person as you're going to meet. She is awesome. And she's just out there working her butt off uh, making this harvest happen. It was fun to be out there that day. Some of you may know, know this already, but this was a uh, University of Manitoba. Do you have anybody here know Farouk Delejani? Besides the obvious, the obvious players know Farouk Delejani. Is he still there? Does anybody know? Is he still working on that project? Um, it was pretty simple. He hadn't, uh, he hadn't um, published anything yet, but he said it's pretty clear. Here's the hempcrete. Here's the conventional. The hempcrete insulates better. There's a lot of issues in the industry, as Andrea and I have talked about now, about things like certification, and I'm sure the hempcrete guys talked about it today, 
but this was not somebody that was trying to make hemp sound better for any particular reason. This was a, sci a postdoctoral scientist in freezing weather telling me very kindly while the study was still going on what it was showing. And uh, I've been a believer in hemp hempcrete ever, ever since. I can't wait to, wait to have hempcrete. There's the real hero of hemp bound. I think we can all agree. Um, um, I mean, all kidding aside, this thing is awesome. Um, I'd, like to, I'd love to hear Simon talk about the, this uh, situation now. If I, if I might write it that this thing is in field trial. So the, the, the body of the tractor is made from, from hemp. I have more things people have told me to ask about what's injected. Are we injecting it with biomaterials yet? Uh, you know, what, what's the sealant and all that kind of jazz? But regardless of the answer to those questions, the rhetoric in, an, in a college where I can say, hey, look at this. This is um, a tractor harvesting Manitoba hemp made from Manitoba hemp. It's a nice talking point. A um, little bit on big versus small ag. Um, I know we've got purveyors of both here. I think there's room for it um, in, in hemp. Um, if, hemp if, the, if the US implements, you know, I, I really hope uh, heaven is listening, the, the GMO ban that, uh, with hemp. Um, I wrote it into New Mexico's legislation today. Um, I am absolutely, I think there's room for, for everybody. You could name the Moldavort company names, the companies that shall, be, shall not be named, because I believe in, in, in the reach of the applications, and I believe in the hemp brand, and I believe in the evolution of uh, the consumer that's going to seek out regional and local products that are high quality, produced well, organic when possible. But that said, Ryan Laughlin got into hemp not, again, for a tie-dye reason. It's because his family was hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt and the sort of GMO cycle wasn't working for him anymore. He wanted to break out of the cycle. That's true of a lot of American farmers and probably true of some Canadian farmers um, as well. On the other hand, Manitoban Colleen Dick with her story of getting husband Grant to plant 60 acres of hemp because she wanted to have a better energy bar for her triathlons, wins the Manitoba food fight, and now, if I'm not mistaken, if she doesn't sell in every province, she sells in nearly every province. Being one of you kind Canadians, you're like the nicest people on earth. She sends me back with 40 pounds of this stuff after my, my interviews uh, here last year for Hempbound. And I got one of those kind of wisecracking border guys um, as I went back who said, uh, any illegal drugs you're bringing back from Canada? And then I was like, if we're really talking federal law, <laughs> this is before the farm bill, my shirt, my pants, my breakfast, oh, 40 pounds of cannabis in my carry-on bag. He just sort of was like, ha, ha welcome back to the US. But that said, I, should, I got my first, I was really you know, of the belief that the culture war issue with, with hemp in Canada does not exist, that you guys have done such an awesome job. I swear I've never met a Canadian who didn't understand about hemp. And, um, and you know, this, this, I never met a Slovenian that didn't understand about hemp either. But yesterday at Winnipeg airport, uh, I got caught off guard. The, the, I got more questions than I normally get from you less paranoid than American Canadians. Um, the, the border guy said, uh, what's, your, what do you, what's your business here? And I said, uh, business conference. He said, what business conference? And I said, uh, Canadian you know, uh, Hemp Trade Alliance. And he said, what is that, some kind of marijuana selling thing? And I thought, come on, come on. Don't worry, I'm still a fan of Canada. But anyway, big and small, I think there's room for all. In the States, we have this cultivar issue. This is all I'm gonna say about this quagmire of American farmers trying to get, in, uh, trying to get uh, hemp seed. It's a real issue. Um, thank you for helping us. I understand all of you, Jace made the good point today here. He doesn't want to get, and several people here, don't want to get on no-fly lists by messing with federal law, but please pay close attention be as careful as you want to be. Don't get into the shipping to America business until, or you know, yeah. Don't get into it until you have what your personal uh, uh, assurance from Mitch McConnell or Barack Obama that uh, that it's okay. Whatever you want to do, wait. Um, but please pay attention. Things are changing so fast in the states with regard to to, to how it goes. We could talk for a half an hour about the nuances of what happened just with Kentucky seeds. I learned some new things about Kentucky seeds. Many of you know there was a lawsuit surrounding the return of seeds to the University of Kentucky so that it could cultivate in sync with our, legaliza our federal legalization of hemp for research purposes, seeds that were seized. 
There's way more to the story than that. It was a genuine compromise. And at this moment, speaking with Andrea today, and jump in if I'm not conveying this accurately, if you're in sync with that federal farm bill and your state laws and decide that you're going to go through the DEA permitting process, there are ways to legally obtain your seed today in the US, let's say from Canadian or from any other kind of seed. But the point being is if you're at all uneasy about it and want to keep to the letter of the law, that's fantastic, but please pay close attention. Follow me on Twitter, I promise you'll be the first to know um, big changes are happening. If not S359, some kind of rider explicitly stating in some other bill in the US saying importation of hemp seeds is legal and will not be seized by any f that could happen. Um, th there's a lot of support in the states for him. Um, for me, th the soil remediation issue is real. It's not a nice offshoot. This is this is eastern Colorado soil. I don't know if the Canadian heartland is suffering as much. Perhaps it is, but boy, drought, monoculture, climate change. This is not the Grapes of Wrath, 1934. This is 2012 Colorado. This is mid-season in a winter wheat crop in eastern Colorado. Um, these people are struggling, and they have, are out of alternatives, and they're looking to you. They know. I've had more than one person who thinks Barack Obama was born in Pakistan tell me, I know what those Canadians are make, making up there. That's why I want to do that. And, and, yeah, these are my peeps, you know, I'm a rural American, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, ran, I'm a hillbilly by choice, I'm a born-again freedom lover. Not quite packing a gun all the time, but I'll tell you, I did get a, a, a raid, I did get a bear raid on my, another climate change, another reason for my hamsterism, 150,000 acre wildfire behind my ranch, called the Funky Butte Ranch in New Mexico, and um, scared this giant boar, this black bear, I used to live for years, as I said, in Alaska, and I know what a big brown bear looks like. I know what a grizzly bear looks like. I saw them every day. They were way more in this, interested in the salmon than I was. Bear researchers all around me. I was in bear country. And this was a big black bear, bigger than I'd ever seen. And in, basically in front of my family's eyes, we were sleeping outside. It was right, hopped uh, our fence, killed most of my goats. Uh, it was just in a, it was a, it was a climate change refugee. It didn't even eat them. It went to the next ranch, killed 11 sheep before our fish and game department caught up with it. Um, so the, the climate change issues for me are not theoretical, as they're not for any of us. Um, I was just visiting with hempsters in, hemp farmers in Vermont the other day, and I, I had no idea. This Hurricane I, Irene a year or two ago, it, it took out neighborhoods in southern Vermont. Everybody's waking up to millennial events. Yeah, try every three years. When I moved into my ranch in, in, in 2006, Noah had to deal with 40 days and 40 nights. Soon after I moved in, 43 days, the flood was so intense on my local river, I, I couldn't get to town for 43 days. Some of my neighbors tried. This is when the river started to go out. Um, my goats, by the way, from what little I've been able to acquire, I saw Andrea feeding her pigs the, the, the hemp hearts, and um, I knew that this was something I should do. I, I know about the studies in Manitoba for the, for the poultry. I've got chickens and ducks. Um, and so I give little handfuls of it uh, to, you know, expensive handfuls of, of, of you know, Nutiva and Manitoba Harvest, and um, they love it. They break into the house to get it. Um, my goats are really the part of the family. I name them all after singers that I secretly like, but who have goat-like voices. So I have um, <laughs> Natalie Merchant, uh, Melissa Etheridge, um, Bette Midler, Stevie Nicks, Bjork, Bjork's our current milker, and, um, and her baby Taylor Swift. That's Taylor Swift right there. <clears throat> They're really ready for hemp. I'll show you proof in a later slide. Um, I'm into textiles. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm into the textile side of thing, and I don't know if I mentioned this, but Andrea, such a fantastic host on that trip. She doesn't just introduce me to every you know hempster that's that's available and in town. She doesn't just prove that hemp-fed eggs are superior, we cook them up on her wood stove and look at the yolks as they're cooking up. No, she does more than that. She takes me to the forks and we go to the Hemporium. And today, I just thought, this is a proud, pretty, this is an honor. I'm speaking Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance. I'm putting on a, my best face as someone that knows a little bit about hemp at this point. And, and as an American trying to, trying to put on a good face, I'm going to put on my good, awesome, you know, two-year-old hemp pants not even remembering until we were talking about how we met that 
I got this when you were showing me around the Hemporium. I mean, these are brand new. Look at this. It's amazing. I wear these a lot. I milk goats in these things. Um, and I testified for changing the international uh, drug conventions. There's three of them. They have to change. They may change at the 2016 United Nations General Assembly Special Session convened at the request of the, at the uh, presidents of Mexico, Colombia, and Venezuela. Pay attention to it. Ungas 2016, it affects hemp to a degree. Um, anyway, each year leading up to Ungas, they have testimony about it. And uh, a nonprofit asked me to testify. I was wearing this shirt. Um, this guy <laughs> is a, uh, like a modern temperance guy. He thinks even alcohol should be illegal. And um, yeah, he had to sit there li listening to me like speak what I hope we all acknowledge as the truth, um, uh, that the only way to solve the problems associated with with, with illegal drugs is to, to regulate them because otherwise you just create criminal economies. Uh, duh, Einstein said it. He looked at, came to his first visit, one of his first entries in his, you can get a book, Einstein's Impressions of America, first visit to America, first couple of pages. He's like, pro, is it during alcohol prohibition. Prohibition of something that people want just degrades people's respect for laws of all kinds. Um, so I don't know whether he really liked his whiskey or not, but uh, anyway. I'm really into the textile side of things, and I've been very, very impressed with um, the hand, the textiles industry term, the hand is the softness that you can get with hemp. Not just modern, but at the Hemp Museum in Amsterdam, it's silky soft. And I'm really kind of, if I have the time, I want to really research the modes and methods of getting hemp to various uh, softnesses. Um, but one good uh, Kentucky story is one of the first things those hemp breaks were used for that you saw on the earlier slide was this woman who runs a really small looming, looming business took this armful of bast. Um, her name's Stephanie. Do you know Kentucky's know her? Stephanie. Um, and uh, I can't remember the name of her company. She's got a website. Um, and she, I said, what are you doing with this? She said, I'm putting it on the loom and making it into a shirt. And uh, I loved that 2014 Kentucky spirit first year uh, making something out of the hemp fibers. Hemp fibers, guys. Don't, don't abandon it. Um, a little bit about the hemp brand here. Um, this may be the extreme side of the hemp brand, but all I'm going to say is, and I'm a huge fan of David Bronner and all of his efforts on genetically modified food. For those who are of the same opinion, and I'm, uh, you're not bad people, in my opinion, if you're, if you're, if you, if you're not on the same page with me, but, uh, and with David Bronner, but I will say this. Uh, he sank $7.1 million of his own money into a labeling campaign in Oregon that is too close to call. If you're following this at all, the issue at all, it's a recount is on right now for Measure 2 in Oregon. Um, the Voldemorts put, uh, I don't know what it was, 25 something million dollars into it. It was an interesting campaign. Um, I studied Mendocino County's uh, or sort of organic local or psychoactive legalization program for a previous book. It was sheriff supported fundraising, total success program in Mendocino County for a book called Too High to Fail. Mendocino County, not coincidentally, was the first county in the U.S., the first municipality to ban genetically modified organisms, and there have been raids of Roundup Ready crops in Mendocino County, California. Um, this reading issue is real. I'm only going to say about this to people who know far more than I do is it's interesting that if you look at an etching from 11th century France uh, about hemp, it's not that different from what a hemp field looks like today. And again, as I learned from people like Simon and others that were talking about it today, there are reasons for high-end BAST applications why, again, Simon, jump up and say I'm totally wrong if it's not true, why good old-fashioned fungal redding in the field is what you need to do still in 2014. Is, there, is that at least semi, a semi-accurate statement? And, and uh, you know, I'm, in, I'm following all of it. The decortication, real and, and hopeful. The, um, I was looking at ch uh, Chinese decortication machines just today uh, for a tri-cropping facility that I, that I, 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 I want to set up. And uh, the great work in Europe that's going on in enzymatic and, and, and here in, at the Composites Innovation Center on enzymatic uh, options for understanding and acting on the fungal battle. But how amazing that for some of the more cutting edge digital age applications, we may be relying on, on medieval uh, harvesting techniques for our fiber. To me, that's pretty damn cool. It kind of justifies living on a goat ranch 40 miles from the nearest town in some ways. Um, I love doing this, you know, for, again, for a college audience. Um, 
I like to say that uh, I think that our beloved hemp is going to be a bigger cannabis niche than psychoactive cannabis uh, in the medium and long term because while Coors is big, Exxon Mobil is bigger. Um, and I would love to see the McHemp sandwich, provided it's GMO free. And uh, just curious, out of a show of hands, how many people are familiar with this photograph? Oh, great. I'm glad I got to expl explain it. Andrea knows about it. So I believe it was Adam Eidinger who turned this up uh, in the Washington Post archives. This is a taxpayer-funded USDA hemp researcher um, studying those, very, you know, what's generally simplified as the Kentucky uh, germplasm, now mostly gone, uh, if not all gone, um, in a field in Virginia that today is, bongo roll, the Pentagon. So uh, I think that's pretty cool. That's a US heritage thing. Um, you know, I'm sure this battle is over. We have, you have your, 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 your you know, province honchos uh, here at the conference. Slam in Slovenia, you know, national ministers coming to this World Hemp Congress. In the States, it's still amazing to me that, um, you know, this is not an Occupy Wall Street base. This is the new leader of the US Senate, um, Mitch McConnell. Um, I am a huge fan of Mitch McConnell, whereas I'm not a huge fan of most um, um, hardcore conservatives. He's a hempster and he's passionate about it and I think he's one of the reasons why I think S359 is gonna pass and his pet foreign policy issue is Burma. So he kind of bribed me back in 1995, I think it was, out of college, I, I was a new journalist pounding the pavement. I went to Burma. I got an interview with the democracy dissident Aung San Suu Kyi. It was a fantastic experience. It sounds really cool in a bar because I actually got stabbed on the way to her house, but it was just a scratch. But so, yeah, that's right. So I was reporting in Burma. Anyway, so I was reporting in Burma and um, wrote this story. And there's a, honestly, ask me about it later tomorrow if you want because it's kind of a cool story about how I had to how I had to fax the story into the Washington Post. But it ran in the Washington Post and Mitch McConnell read it into the congressional record and I was a, a complete unknown at that point. I've always been a fan of Mitch McConnell. Whoops. But he is the, uh, you know, he's the most powerful man and you got your Kentucky, you're sitting pretty. These guys back there, they want a new golf course, all they have to do is call Mitch and uh, it's gonna happen. And that's Earl Blumenauer who is the, I may have mentioned this earlier, but uh, he's the congressman from Oregon who, uh, fantastic guy, who's been working, by the way, for cannabis legalization since 1972. Oregon was the first U.S. state to decriminalize in 1973. Um, and he was a state legislator then. Anyway, he comes to the Measure 91 Victory Party in Portland. I, I was there covering it. And he gets up on the stage, and I, I feel like I said this at the beginning. The, f the first words out of his mouth, practically, were, we're gonna, well, this is such a mandate everywhere, we're going to be pushing hemp uh, this session. So you got the you know pretty far left and the pretty far right doing a little we, it's healing of the nation dance. Sorry if I'm a little bit optimistic. I've got kids, okay? I want, I'll cling to anything, and um, it's looking pretty damn good. So um, my accountant, um, she thinks Obama was born in, in Pakistan, if not uh, you know Neptune, and um, I I came in and, and uh, dropped off. Um, my, uh, my, my numbers uh, this spring and she said, look, I've got hemp moisturizing cream. And then Taylor Swift barges into the house, jumps on the table and just looks cute till I give her a handful of, of Canadian hemp hearts. So thank you once again. You've kept my livestock uh, behaving themselves such as it is. And um, I'm, I'm the, I, says I see my role, I'm a, I'm a voice for spreading the hemp uh, message to uh, places that it hasn't yet gone. Um, uh, Heartland, United States, college audiences, they may know about hemp and support hemp, but they don't know uh, really the niches, the industries that they can get into. So again, uh, ping me when you want a message sent. Uh, I'm here to help. Uh, I tweet every day at Organic Cowboy. You can bring me in for events if you want. Uh, thanks for telling everyone about Hemp Bound, and thanks for listening to an over-enthusiastic uh, American uh, hamster. Thank you very much.